as a mate in recent years, what was he like? Uh, probably, probably a gent gentleman, gentlemanly. You know, they're the epitome of gentle, gentlemanly. To the point you would try to be like him because, you know, he would uh, be so pleasant and unassuming. He's more interested in how you were than, than he was. You know, I, I visited him not long after he had some health problems and I just said, hi, Ray, how are you? And he says, oh, who cares about me? How about you? What's been happening? How's the family? How's, you know, but that's just his attitude. He was dying, but he didn't care about that as long as I was OK. And uh, life and family were, were good. What a lovely way to describe him. He had the sense uh, when I met him of profound good fortune. I mean, he just couldn't believe his luck. He lived precisely the kind of life he wanted to live, with one or two exceptions, right? Yeah, yeah. We all have problems in life. It doesn't matter whether you're a nobody or famous, you've mm. got life's problems to deal with. Can you take us back to the invaders? and what they did, because our younger listeners in particular will know she's a mod, but they will not know how they exploded across the Tasman and reinvented our sense of possibility, right? The way we saw what New Zealanders were capable of was entirely changed by that song and that band and what they did. Yes, yeah, true, and then the funny part is that uh... When She's a Mod came out, um, it was released in New Zealand and um, just sort of got a few plays and just faded away. And uh, it wasn't until four or five months later that uh, the Beatles had been and gone and the Rain Invaders were in Australia and uh, it was released in Australia and uh, Australia virtually just went nuts over it. Uh, they, uh, and because the Beatles had just been and they, they were looking for anything with a year, year, year in it. <laughs> And the right look, and uh, Ray had it, and uh, all of a sudden exploded in Australia, and then exploded back home here. You know, four, four months after, nobody was really interested in it. Typical Kiwis, it took uh, somebody else to say how good something. Yeah, was. That, yeah, boy, that that was a cultural cringe, wasn't it? A fine example of it. And yeah, so, quite, it, quite, it, quite embarrassing. Yeah, really. yeah. It, it, it went number one of both sides of the Tasman, and it stayed number one for a long time, didn't it? Especially in Australia, yeah, yeah. We, we didn't really have official sales charts, so it's saying was number one. It's a bit messy over here because there was no <laughs> official chart at that time. But you know, the Australian had all the, the Australians had all the charts, and um, yeah, it's very popular. Just yeah, probably the one of the biggest hits, of, biggest probably one of the biggest non-Beatle hits of that particular year, because that was the year of the Beatles. So but they, they were they were competing, and accompanied by when they performed throughout that year really and beyond the same kind of hysteria that the Beatles got. Perhaps not the camping outside the hotels and stuff, but in the concert, the screaming and the swooning and all of that stuff, they were getting that, weren't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, to, to the point that I'd actually feel embarrassed because they'd be getting more screams than some of the uh, overseas acts that they were supporting on some of those tours. You know, they... <laughs> He said, uh, I remember Ray telling me once when he was in San Francisco in the late 60s, he bumped into Dave Clark from the Dave Clark Five. Yeah. And, um, like, and Ray and the Invaders were sort of on the, sort of the support act for when Dave Clark Five were in uh, touring New Zealand. And pretty much they, uh, they were pretty average. They weren't a great group, Dave Clark Five. They were good on record, but they weren't a great live band. And hence Ray Columbus and the Invaders getting all of the all the screams of the majority. And... Uh, yeah, for four years later, Ray bumps into Dave Clark in San Francisco and says, oh, hi, it's Ray Columbus here, remember me? And he just walked away. <laughs> You're joking. Are you? He's, he was packing his sad. Yeah, 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 even then. Even then. Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good story. Yeah, what, it was. There's it, it, so many good Ray stories, of the, you know, the, the never-ending. Yeah. And, 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 and I, my sense of him is that they were defined by his sheer sparkling-eyed wonder at the preposterousness of all of this happening to him. You know, he he constantly looked like a man who'd, you know, been pleasantly surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good summing up, actually. He, uh, he did tell me not long ago that 
he's not worried about dying because he knows he's done so much that he's, he's fitted 10, 10 lifetimes into his short 74 years and um, he, had, he had no apprehensions about dying. He said, I've, I've done it all. This, I'm just so, such a lucky man. So, um, yeah. <laughs> He sort of, I mean, there was a false alarm terribly mm. a wee while ago. But he had been sick for a while, hadn't he? And he and he, he didn't, as you said, I mean, you went to visit him and he inquired after your health. He didn't make much of a fuss about that, did he? No, there was, a, uh, I'll put this way, about eight years ago, the, the listener got hold of me and because that's when, you know, he was probably... Uh, not going to make it through the week, and um, I remember the listener ringing me up and saying, "I oh, can, we just finished writing his obituary. Can you send me send us some photos?" And I said, "No, I can't send any photos. Cause he's not dead yet, and I, I'm pretty sure he's going to, you know, knowing Ray as I do, I'm pretty sure he's going to pull out of this, and he did. And here we are, what eight years later. Mm. So definitely a definitely a cat of nine lives, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah." He's had quite a few lucky escapes, apparently, over his lifetime. You know, what was he suffering from, Grant? Oh, rather than go into the technical details, but one of the diseases he's got three different diseases, uh, without going into specifics. But one of them is the same disease that uh, Max Merritt has as well. Gosh, that's a uh, that's a small world, isn't it? Given their well, pa yeah. pa parallel careers. That's right, and both both working from the. U.S. Air Force Base, yeah, gigging there, and, and some of yeah. the some of the invaders ended up with Max, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not another story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then they came, they came yeah. back, and didn't, didn't yeah. stay long. Yeah, can, can, but can, they, they didn't realise how good it was with Ray till they left, and then it was too late. You know. Yeah, can, can we look at highlights for him after the invaders because? He worked. He kept working, didn't he? And he never achieved the same level of hysterical fame. But he was loved, and 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 he just kept on going. What what were the highlights of his post invaders career? Do you think? I think just his mentoring role, mentoring up and coming artists, everybody from Annie Crummer to uh, Tina Cross, all those people, and uh, lot, lots more that, that probably owe their career to. Um, Ray's involvement and mentoring uh, right up to Z, which, you know, they had some big records um, in the late 90s. And, um, he, he was generous, wasn't he? And he, you know that oh, lovely yeah. adage, you know, a, a candle that lights another candle doesn't go out. He, he, mm. that, that was kind of his attitude towards the business, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. He was always giving and um, never asked for anything. I, I said to him once, well, you know, you wrote a lot of stuff in the 60s and you stopped writing what why was that and he said oh i don't like pushing my stuff on other people and nobody asked me to write for them i won't write anything and, um, and as you're saying that he was showing me his um he's got a book of a uh, lyric book and, um, he was flicking through that and showing me some of the stuff he had written words for but never finished because he didn't want, didn't want to finish writing them and start you know Pushing on to people, you know, you'd rather people ask him and uh, no one asked, so he. <laughs> so, I don't know what that says actually. But, um, yeah. It's um, very unassuming, you know. Yeah. Goes back to that gentlemanly, gentlemanly thing.